Welcome to McLean's Live, live, like right? That. In person, what the heck? Um, I'm Allison Uncles, I'm the editor-in-chief of McLean's Magazine. Working at all. Um, but uh, I'm very happy to welcome you tonight. Um, we've been doing these, there we go, uh, virtual in interviews for the last eight, 19 months or so. Well, it's been a trooper online, but this is our first foray into face-to-face -face interviews, so really thrilled about tonight. I think it's going to be a great conversation with Paul and Anne McClellan and Lisa Raitt. Um, but it's been quite a thing to get this off, off the ground again after being on hiatus for a little while. So I want to thank very profusely our partners, the wonderful team at the NAC, um, always fabulous to work with, always a great view and a great room. Um, CPAC, our wonderful broadcast partners who are airing this tonight, and of course the Canadian Bankers Association, our sponsor, um, who've been with us from the beginning, many years long series, and without whom we really couldn't do this. So I'm thrilled to pass the microphone to Anthony Pulci again. Our first, we used to do this every month and <laughs> we're out of practice, but it's great to see you, Anthony. He's the Chief Strategy Officer and the Head of Government Relations of the Canadian Bankers Association, and he's going to introduce Paul Wells. Thank you very much. Um, if I can establish the obvious context, uh, just boring on those remarks. Um, I had never used the word social distancing um, but when I stood here the last time doing this introduction, and so you know here we are um, because of because of social distancing and because of vaccines, we're able to gather again, and it's such a nice feeling. This is the first time I've had a suit on, and the first time I've been at an event uh, <laughs> since March of 2020, and so it's a great feeling. <laughs> so we are very proud to sponsor this series. Um, an excellent idea from Paul when it uh, first started, and he has had a series of excellent guests, and tonight is no exception. And so with that, I'll hand this to Paul, and let's begin the conversation. I, on the other hand, uh, just sat at home wearing a suit for two years. <laughs> Uh, as a matter of fact, this very suit, so don't get too close. Uh, it, is, it is really great to be back at the National Arts Centre. We're uh, speaking to you tonight from the Pacific Room of the National Arts Centre, overlooking the mighty Pacific. Um, you can see the Shore Club, and then from, from behind the Shore Club is the mighty Pacific. Uh, uh, always always use, a, uh, use a joke until it, it's got no life left in it, my dad always said. Uh, I did do this uh, series from my living room for more than a year, uh, and it was a lot of fun. We had some good conversations with a lot of really interesting people. Um, Jonathan Wilkinson, Jason Kenney, Patty Haidu, and a few others. Uh, but honestly, it's really good to get the band back together again. We are so grateful for the support of the National Arts Centre in providing us uh, wonderful venues. We're really happy to have our friends at CPAC sharing what we do with a broader audience. And uh, we're grateful to the Canadian Bankers Association, the always dapper Anthony Polchi, for making uh, these uh, events possible. Um, tonight, we're at the intersection of past and future. We're going to talk to uh, to wonderful Nova Scotians who went out into the rest of the world and made good and became respectively Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, Deputy Leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, but they are not done. They have spent two days here at a summit talking about the future of Canada, the prosperity of Canada in the uncertain period after this catastrophe that we've all lived through, uh, and they have a lot to share, both about their own experience, their uh, observations about what was happening up uh, uh, at Rideau Hall uh, in the last couple of days, and also a little bit about this coalition for a better future that they co-preside. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Lisa Raitt and Anne McClellan. Hello, Paul. Any chair? Yeah. Yeah. 
It is great uh, to see you both. Wonderful to see you. Thanks for having us. Um, let's start with this. You were both natural resources minister at different times. You, your ten years in parliament didn't actually overlap. You no, you, no. you you came here in two thousand and eight, and you I left as did many liberals in two thousand and six. Yes. yes. As I say, we left in two thousand and six. And you had a lot of uh, a lot of uh, cabinet positions. I assume you were watching closely when uh, the shuffle this week. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you make of the shuffle, and what memories, good and bad, uh, did it kick up? Uh, Anne McClellan, we'll start with you. Well, <laughs> I remember my first. Um, entry into cabinet, you may remember that uh, I won my first election by 11 votes. And uh, I didn't even know I'd won until 11 o'clock in a room in that hotel, the Westin. And I was quite convinced the Prime Minister had already asked someone else, there were four of us who'd been elected from Alberta, and that he had asked somebody else. But I get this call at 11. The judicial recount had just ended in Edmonton, Alberta, and his office said, uh, you're in the cabinet, he waited for you, be at the Rideau Hall gate at 8 o'clock the next morning. Huh. And I, I actually did not expect that the prime minister would have waited, but he did, and uh, I guess the rest is uh, history. Um, uh, this cabinet shuffle that has just happened, or a new cabinet really after the election, um, I think maybe some surprises, but um, I think some people who have shown themselves to be good performers were elevated, perhaps given tougher jobs. Um, and obviously Anita Anand would be one who falls into that category. I think a very strong performer in the first mandate, or sorry, the 19 uh, mandate. Uh, so uh, putting a cabinet together is really hard. And I think people don't always appreciate how hard it is to balance all the, uh, the regional issues, linguistic issues, um, uh, gender, uh, skill set. Cultural learning about the people, especially new people have been elected. PM doesn't necessarily know very much about them, doesn't know how he or she will work with other colleagues, with him. Mm -hmm. So it's, it really is an art, I, I think, uh, and uh, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Is it easier for a new government in some ways? Uh, um, everyone's still learning the ropes, everyone's less experienced, but I, I sometimes feel like um, more seems possible when you just arrive in office. Do you want to take that or? <laughs> well, I, I, came in, um, I came in in the second mandate of Harper. So yeah. he was in, in 06, I came in in 08, so I was the newbie. And in my case, I showed up at Rideau Hall, walked into the room, and a lot of the current cabinet members look, looked around and said, what is Rate doing here? <laughs> and then the second question was, what did he give Rate? <laughs> And so John Baird was the first one to bound over to me and say, hey, Rate, uh, what'd you get? And I said, I got natural resources. And the look of shock on his face made me really second guess what the heck I was about to get myself into. I was terrified. And then he said to me, well, what about the former minister of uh, natural resources? And I said, I have no answer for you on that one. I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the, the way it was set up for me. And Gary then- Lund. Gary Lunn was your predecessor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I have you, no answer either. You get, <laughs> and then you get whisked away uh, by your deputy, yeah. and mm -hmm. it's like you're hostage for eight years, mm -hmm. and then you're allowed out. <laughs> That's basically my experience, Paul. Were you well treated by your captors? Absolutely. I value so much the relationships I built with the with the officials in this town. They are some yeah. of the smartest people yeah. that you can possibly ever want to work with, and good and kind and. And uh, I really enjoyed it, and I learned a lot from them. But I was lucky. I had two, I had two women as my first DMs, and um, they really helped me navigate the ropes, and they gave me a lot of support. I often got the impression, I'll stick with you just for a second, Lisa, that um, uh, your government had a tense relationship in theory with the public service. But I almost never met a minister who was getting along poorly. I, I hear there were a couple. But in, there, it was rare to find a minister who was getting along poorly with their officials. Yeah. That when you actually meet people face to face, you realize 
you've got a job to do, you've got a, you know, a, a ways of working together and that, and that it was actually a strong relationship. Yeah. So I would say this, that yeah, maybe that was the impression that was given, but I can tell you that Prime Minister Harper always told us that the smarter people in the duo was always going to be the deputy minister and to respect the officials and that they were there for a reason, they gave you good advice. We do the politics, we make the decisions, mm -hmm. no one else makes the decisions, but they're there to give you good advice and they oftentimes give you great advice. What's going, what's happening to these new ministers now, uh, the, the ones who are new in cabinet or new in, in positions? I get the impression that the sort of operational tempo of, 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 of their life has just Changed multiplied. Changed dramatically. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say, especially for the brand new ministers, it's a combination of excitement, exhilaration, and just sheer fear, yeah. right? And maybe women I'm, uh, do it more than some men, but I, I have to be honest, you know, when, when I became Minister of Natural Resources those first few days, my inclination was to think, you know, what am I doing here? Right? Can I do this? Uh, what am I going to mess up? Right? And uh, then you get over that. And in my part, uh, or largely, uh, I think, because of the deputy I had, who was the senior deputy in the government at the time, Mr. Billado. And he was just this amazing gentleman. And uh, maybe I'm sure Mr. Kretchen had planned this. Here's this newbie from Edmonton, Alberta. I've just made her Minister of Natural Resources. Um, you are going to have to make sure that she survives at least the first few months, right? And he was amazing, helping me adjust to the department, learn the files, uh, start meeting stakeholders, and giving me confidence, giving yeah. me confidence that I could do this. Yeah, they treat you like a minister right away. It's, they call you minister. Yeah. And you are that person in that moment, so you are going to have to live up to it. When I was elected, when I was put into, I told Anne the story the other day, uh, when I went into cabinet, of course, I came from Ontario, they put me into the energy file, and Dalton McGuinty was the premier at the time, and I kind of came out of nowhere. I'm a woman, I'm a lawyer from Cape Breton in Ontario. You know, is she really a conservative kind of question? <laughs> so there was a Toronto Sun editorial, and it was a picture of me crouching on a phone outside of Rideau Hall saying, hey Dalton, it's me, I'm in, what do I do now? <laughs> So I had that extra pressure of thinking, do my are these my friends? Like, am I part of this? So it's a whole new experience. Yeah. I didn't know anybody else. I never met them on campaign. We were all in our own ridings. You both, been, as I say, natural resources minister. The new natural resources minister is Jonathan Wilkinson, who yes. is clean tech entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, just just a few days ago was environment minister. Yeah. That's a, a bit of a departure from the situation where the resources ministers often. Uh, um, the voice of the oil patch and the voice of the resource producing sector kind of in counterweight to the environment minister. There's talk that uh, uh, Wilkinson and Stephen Guibault, the new environment minister, are going to be a tag team. Does that uh, make structural sense? Do you think that that's uh, a, a, a good idea? It may make sense in relation to the climate change file, which obviously is one of the three or four top priorities of, of this government. Um, I, Jonathan, as you said, comes from an environment and climate change. He knows that file. He knows clean tech. I think what Jonathan will be able to do, he has the respect of the industry, right? Oil and gas and other aspects of the resource portfolio, if you like. Uh, he's a straight shooter. And I think one of the things he will do is try and make the resource sectors, I guess, feel more comfortable around the transition that we're already in, right? There's no denying, nobody in Alberta in the oil patch any longer, at least the big guys, nobody denies that we're in a transition. We're in the early days of the transition, but we're there. Mm. And I think uh, that part of the portfolio has a reasonable amount of confidence in Jonathan, um, I'm not telling tales out of school. I think they probably are more skeptical about the new Minister of Environment and Climate Change. But I think they're happy that Jonathan's in NRK. And that, yes, uh, he'll work with the new Minister of Environment uh, because they just have to work together to get this transition off the ground and right. But I think you'll also see Jonathan being very pragmatic and helping make the case that the resource sectors are moving 
through the transition. It's going to be costly, it's going to take time, it's going to be disruptive, but if we all work together, we can get there. Lisa Raitt, what do you think? Yeah, you know, um, you could say that Prime Minister Harper kind of did the same thing with me and Jim Prentice. Jim Prentice went into environment, I went to natural resources. You know, the question is who's speaking for the environment if Jim Prentice is an environment and he's from Alberta. Uh, I, I thought it made perfect sense what the Prime Minister did. I actually had thought that they were going to do that, to be honest, because the Anarchan is where the money is. That's where the program is. That's where people know how to roll out these programs that are going to be needed. So it would make sense for him to stay there. And all that being said, uh, I thought Seamus O'Regan did a good job. I thought that he spoke well. I thought that he understood the files. And he worked very well with his counterpart in Alberta, Sonny Savage. And I hope to see that same kind of level of cooperation of this NRCAN minister yeah. with the rest of the provinces. That thing where you say nice things about a liberal, does that, uh, is that automatic, or do you have to spend a few months learning how to do that when you get out of politics? Hey, hey Dalton, it's me, I'm in. <laughs> Uh, I do want to, before we get on to the sort yes. of meat of the matter, which yes. is, which is uh, what you've been doing in town right. this week, yeah. um, once you're out of politics, w w did, were you looking over your shoulder at what was going on in Ottawa all the time, or did you enjoy a kind of a cleanse? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say a cleanse, no. I, I, but I also wouldn't say looking over my shoulder. But look I mean once you're in this business mm -hmm. of politics mm -hmm. you are interested I do watch power in politics or mm -hmm. power play if I happen to be at home uh, and certainly during COVID mm -hmm. I watched it more often than I had since I'd left politics mm -hmm. in 06 because I was working from home. So you're always interested. You're always keeping an eye on, you know, the big stories of the day, who's moving where, who said something that you think, oh my gosh, that's not gonna be good. Um, yeah, so I don't, think, I don't think I would want to be cleansed in that that was such a blessed period of my life and the people I met on all sides of the house, remarkable people. Um, so, I, yeah, I, st I still keep a watchful eye, and Paul, I will be the first to admit, some days I'm screaming at the television saying, you know, how could that happen? Like, who let that person out, yeah. right? I mean, I do, I do. Care to name names? No, I'm not going to do that. I am not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lisa Raid, same question. So I think it could be different between if you're in opposition or if you're in government. I don't know how you enjoyed being on the sidelines during the Harper years. I find it difficult watching uh, what's going on with my party in opposition right now, but I have no desire to go back. That's the weird part. No desire to go back, no burning need to go revisit where I spent so much time. I don't think that that's uh, something that I would enjoy doing again. I'm glad I did it, I'm honored I did it. But no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm done with that, and I, I do enjoy the policy side. I'm very opinionated, and I'm still partisan, but that all being said, that part of my life is closed. I couldn't agree more, right? I think once you go, you probably should be gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whether the voters tell you to go or whether you choose to leave yeah. of your own volition, um, I, I think once you're gone, you should be gone. Yeah. It's sometimes my advice to staffers is that if you if you leave the hill, try and throw yourself clear of the blast radius, yeah. Yeah. so you don't get yeah, exactly um, <laughs> exactly. And uh, Lord knows, McLean's has many readers who would yeah. like to throw me clear of what, of, uh, <laughs> of this town. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, so much for closing a chapter. Now about opening a new chapter. Uh, you are the co-presidents of the Coalition for a Better Future, which just finished the two-day summit. I have. Uh, uh, tried many times to explain it, but I figure it's your gig. Why don't you explain it? What is the Coalition for a Better Future? It's about economic growth and the importance of economic growth to our shared, sustainable, inclusive prosperity. Lots of words there, but yeah. that's what we all want for our families, our country. Um, and Lisa, I'm going to let you talk about 
the fact that nobody's been talking yeah. about it very much. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that the coalition has come together. 109 organizations mm -hmm. from all across the country, um, from the private sector, the nonprofit sector, the philanthropic sector, you know, everything from uh, the Black Chamber of Commerce to uh, the BCC to Imagine Canada, United Ways of Canada, uh, Universities Canada, the U15. It is a diverse, broad group who think that we should be focused more and talking more about uh, the preconditions for strong economic growth coming out of COVID and well beyond. Yeah, so 2019, 2021, two elections, not a single mention of long-term economic growth in either. Lots of talk about other transactional kinds of things and lots of talk about targets, nothing about the economic growth that was gonna be needed to ensure prosperity. So it kind of bucked me. It also bothered me that I'm sitting out in the private sector now and um, I'm watching it, people and companies struggle with not really having a plan coming from the government levels. Like, what is the plan? What's going to be happening here? And then I go home and I talk to my kids and I talk to my kids' friends and they all think that Canada's great. We're a really wealthy country. We're always going to be a wealthy country and everything's going to be great all the time. And I think that's a big disconnect. And I. I thought at the time, why not? Anne was going to co-chair this. We had co-chaired something earlier that was, was uh, I thought, really interesting. It's very. Very interesting on deliberative democracy. And this was something that really appealed to me because you need to have that discussion about economic growth. Anne was key for me because it was her government in the 90s that wrestled with the deficit and debt. And what I remember about the 90s was everybody talking about debt and deficit. How did that make it into the common conversation at the dinner table for Canadians? It's such a, it's such a big economic concept, yet we were all on the same page trying to do the same thing. I'd like to see that for economic growth. So um, one of the things that struck me was, first of all, just how huge this thing was getting as it, as it approached. Mm -hmm. the, it was announced a few months ago yeah. that there would be this group that, that will be ongoing mm -hmm. and this summit that would essentially kick off the conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, sort of who wasn't uh, associated with this group? You've got the Canadian Meat Council. You've got the LGBT plus Chamber of Commerce. You've got the Conseil du Patronat du Québec. Yeah. Uh, uh, every think tank, Canada 2020 Public yeah. Policy Forum. Um, and the other thing that struck me is most of these organizations can normally already get noticed by government and have channels for making their concerns known to government. I assume the head of the Conseil du Patronat du Québec mm -hmm can get Pablo Rodriguez on the phone, or Melanie Jolie. Pretty much, yep. So why this, why this banding together and why this sort of second layer of association? I think people felt if we all came together, we would have a better chance of having especially governments, and it's not just one, right? The tendency is to focus on this one in this town, mm -hmm. but in fact, we're very careful to say this is about governments, because if we're going to have sustained economic growth, all three orders of government have to be at the table, right? Climate change is not going to be dealt with unless your big cities are at the table working on their own public policy, but working with the other two orders of government. Yeah. So. Um, we, I think, you're you're right that people can, you know, have their access, uh, whatever shape it might take, uh, to ministers in Ottawa and political staff. But you are one voice, and you're usually viewed as representing your own self interest, right? Very focused on what that particular group might need at that moment. That's not what the coalition is about. We've deliberately asked people to come together to think about what we need to do together to have sustained economic growth. And that does mean that everybody parks their little short-term interests as much as possible uh, at the door and we talk about what we need to be doing and working on to get where we need to be in 10 years. Yeah. When the government asks for advice and they set up a committee, the committee will go out and they'll ask for representations from people. So it's always the information like this. The government's controlling who gets to be asked and the information comes this way. In this case, it's everybody's in the room together talking to each other. 
and not talking to the government and trying to give advice. They're trying to come up with ideas amongst themselves and present a united front. And we got a united front, 97% agreement on the three big pillars. Which are? Employment, uh, sorry, uh, economic growth and employment, yeah. uh, inequality slash inclusion, yeah. and climate change. Yep. What did you, who did you hear from this week? A, 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 a couple of voices that you heard from and what did, what did you hear from them? Okay, we'll start with yesterday afternoon, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard from Carolyn Wilkins and she gave a really, I thought, um, a really important anchor speech on economic growth, why it was important and why this time economic growth has to include inclusion and has to be mindful of sustainability. Carolyn Wilkins was deputy governor of the Bank of Canada. Yep. Many people thought that she would be the governor of the Bank of Canada at some point, and now she's uh, uh, out in the private sector. And, 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 and it was quite a strong speech in which she said, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're not guaranteed of prosperity, and we should nail that down because yeah. it will, from that, all else flows. Yep, yep, yep. And just in relation to Carolyn, keep in mind her global ex uh, perspective is very useful to us as well because she is now doing work for the, uh, the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. And she was the Government of Canada's Sherpa on the G7 meeting yep. last spring. Right, so she's very connected to what the G7 are thinking and doing around economic growth, mm -hmm. and that's very important in terms of helping us all have a better appreciation of, what, quite truthfully, what other countries are doing and what they've gotten right and what they haven't. Yeah, member of the advisory council that we co-chair, which is really important. We rolled in then to focus on inclusion, and we had folks from, uh, we had uh, Alicia Dubois from from Alberta Indigenous Opportunities yeah. Agency, and we had uh, Goodwill Industries, and we had Community Foundations, and they really illuminated us to the real economy that's going on in the quote-unquote not-for-profits. They're doing extremely interesting things, especially Goodwill, where they talked about how in the United States they're helping with disabled employees, making it into the mainstream. And that, I, you know, I hope in those cases, Corporate Canada, who's also a part of the coalition, is listening to that conversation. One of the things we know is that there are an awful lot of people who have the capacity to join the paid workforce, but they haven't had the opportunity. The physically disabled community is a actually quite large community mm -hmm. and one that has not mm -hmm. uh, been provided with uh, the opportunities that you would expect and they are not asked to join the workforce and work to their capacity. This is an expertise that Goodwill has. Mm -hmm. um, the Community Foundations of Canada, uh, their uh, president and CEO spoke uh, in terms of uh, the work they are doing around social enterprise, mm -hmm. right? And how many of us, when we think about the Canadian economy, what do we think about? Do we think about social enterprise? Do we think about entities like Goodwill uh, and others who actually are employing substantial number of people, uh, giving them meaningful work, and uh, giving back to the economy. Those mm -hmm. people who are employed and building a social enterprise or whatever it might be, they are getting wages, they have benefits, they're buying things in the economy, um, they have, uh, they, they feel, uh, you know, the head of the community foundations. Yeah. yeah. This was amazing. Sometimes there's just a story yeah. that hits you. He came to this country as a very small child. His name was not Andrew, but that's what he's known as today, Andrew, right? Nobody in his class, when he was five or six in Toronto, n his little classmates couldn't pronounce his name. Hmm. So his mom and dad and Andrew, because he was simply being left out, decided they would change his name to Andrew. He said, I did that to fit in. Thing he said, fitting in is not belonging, yeah. right? And that is something we should all take to heart because it's about belonging. If we want actually to live up to the image we have of ourselves as Canadians in the world and at home, it, is, it can't be about just fitting in anymore. Yeah. It has to be about true belonging. Yeah. Um, I, want, I, I know you're very careful to say this is all about governance. 
governments. But we, we, we have a government here. Yeah. Uh, 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 fired the finance minister a year ago, let the deputy, uh, let the deputy minister of finance go, uh, brought in a new minister of finance, the thickest budget document in the history of confederation, 732 pages. And they, and they, they, would, they would insist to me that it's all about prosperity and it's all about a long-term plan for Canada. Um, in, in what sense is this event a rebuttal to that claim? I don't know if it's a rebuttal, but I think what we're trying to point out to the government, this government, any government, is the fact that maybe they had a really thick budget document, but the Canadian public certainly don't see the importance of economic growth and prosperity. But there is a great importance for them to understand it and see it. And as a result, bringing together all of this group of coalition members who feel the same. Look, if, if that were the truth, Paul, if that were the case, that everything is fine, no worries about it. Why do we have 109 people signed up in the coalition? And why do we have 14 people on this advisory council that are really impressive people within the economy to help us gather up information and figure out economic prosperity going forward? Um, you know, sometimes during elections, it can be very divisive. It oftentimes is very divisive. And we've had five, we've had five minority governments in the last seven which makes it really difficult to get any long-term planning going. And perhaps, perhaps what we're doing in this case is just trying to get past the transactional kind of elections that are happening and set down a platform that measurements, metrics, that are going to be usable for any political party because it's focused on economic growth, especially since that room had people who vote for any of the parties that are represented in Parliament. Can I just say, I actually read the budget not at the time it was delivered, but when I took up the... No, when I joined wow. you, I thought, I better read the um, budget. I'm glad you uh, did. Yeah, and I did. And what I would say, Paul, is yes, as I read the budget, I smiled to myself over and over again, because there are references to this plan. Mm -hmm. There are references to economic growth. I think somebody said there were 270 discrete um, uh, initiatives, yeah. right? The problem, I think, when you read this budget is that the sum is not greater than the parts. You do have a sense of a lot of activity in the budget, but you don't leave reading the budget with a sense of what the, pro the real priorities are and what the plan is to realize those priorities, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the narrative got lost right around if they if their narrative was prosperity and economic growth yeah. then it got lost in that document and that happens to governments right you don't always get the narrative right or it's not as clear as you would like it to be and i think the narrative got lost somewhat in that budget um, it, it, it was interesting covering that budget because where i came into this story was when i my the first budget i ever covered back in the midst of time was the second budget of your government, yeah. the legendary Paul yes, Martin exactly. budget yeah. deficit yeah. busting yeah. document. And the, and, and the old hands uh, at that time, now long since deceased, told me that it was uh, one, of the, one of the simplest and plainest spoken documents they'd ever seen. Mm. It was a relatively concise budget. Yes. And it yeah. just said what it had to say. And the lesson I took from that is if you're actually doing stuff, you don't have to spend hundreds of pages talking about what you're doing. You, can, you, you just do it. Yeah, sure. and it was very focused, right? Very, because we knew what the world was telling us. We knew what we had to do. Yeah. So there wasn't any need for fancy pros, right? Yeah. I mean, it was, this is how bad it is, and this is what we're going to do to try and fix it. And what we heard from the various speakers this week is that there's an opportunity for Canada, and we really need to take it, because if we don't, we're going to miss the opportunity. So it's that same kind of burning platform is in place, and that's why these folks are concerned about economic growth and prosperity. Did you hear over the course of these couple of days from anyone in government? No, and that was deliberate. This, uh, we will go and talk to them about our scorecard yeah. um, and the, uh, the coalition and what our purpose is. Okay. And we will, there, she, there it is, ladies and she gentlemen. She gave me the look. Hold up the scorecard, <laughs> show Lisa. The, show the That's scorecard. why I'm here. I'm just staffing Ann, guys. I'm just staffing her. <laughs>
<laughs> and I, we, we hope you have a chance to read this, actually. See what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Anyway, I think I lost my train of thought. But, but uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. We're hoping that the government will take look at the scorecard. Yeah, and take absolutely. It yeah. And, and, and what are the next steps? Uh, well, we do plan to engage not only uh, interested ministers and officials uh, in relation to the coalition and uh, the, the scorecard and, and why we're doing what we're doing, but provincial governments, big city mayors who want to talk mm -hmm. to us, um, private sector, whether it's, uh, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, the BCC, uh, the CFIB, yeah. or, or, you know, quite truthfully, yeah. anyone who, uh, either a coalition member or those who aren't, and we're always happy to have more people join the coalition, um, and get the coalition members to amplify the message, right? We want the momentum to build, right? But this is not the end. This no. is just really the beginning, mm -hmm. this yeah. conference. Yep, and um, the scorecard is meant to be filled in and meant to be measured. So next year, measuring against to see how, how things progressed. As well, going back to the Advisory Council, talking to them about what we've heard in this summit for the last two, two days mm -hmm. and getting feedback from them and the coalition as to how they want to proceed. Uh, but proceed we will and create momentum and build momentum and, and hopefully reach through so that Normal Canadians, uh, and they are normal compared to politicians, quite frankly, normal Canadians are talking about economic growth and, and understand the importance. Okay. Um, now you've got me looking at the scorecard. What, uh, there, there's a, the, the green segment, which is essentially yeah. the, um, the, the better. environmental section. No. No, it's no, no. living better. No. It's green's, living better? No, purple is green. <laughs> purple is the uh, climate. Okay. We did that to confuse you. Yeah. Well, let's now, well, now I want to know what living better entails because I'm, sure. I'm missing out. That's Anne's favorite part. So, the Oh, gosh, you're going like to make me put my glasses yeah, 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 on. I am. Yeah. You always explain that one well because I think that's okay. a key indicator. This one, we, we talked about a lot. And um, uh, other parts of the world, um, countries in the European Union use this. Share of youth and we will probably define youth uh, as 15 to 29, which is the OECD definition. Uh, stats can is 15 to 28, but you know, uh, immaterial. So the share of youth not in education, employment, or training, mm -hmm. right? Not. You often measure who is in that age cohort. Okay. We want to know who isn't yeah. in an educational program, a training program, or at work. And then we want to, say, go to the private sector or government, depending. Maybe it's a reskilling program that's yeah. needed. Or maybe the private sector is dropping the ball in yeah. terms of going out there and finding people in that age cohort who are interested in going to work and that they've got the skills to work. Um, so that is the kind of metric in relation to living better. And then it's also in a more discrete category called human capital, yeah. which is what it is. Are we wasting that human cap right. capital right. in that age cohort? Right. If so, why? And what are we going to do about it? Yeah. So these really are indicators that uh, in, in at least many cases you can attach a numerical value yes. to and then you can yes. drive those yeah. numbers yes. up and down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all right. Man, it's awful close to what uh, what they used to call uh, when this government came to town, deliverology, which I don't which, know which wasn't hocus don't pocus. Go there. I don't it, know anything about that. It was it was the idea that you <laughs> uh, you measure government's performance by what you were seeking to achieve rather than simply by uh, what you had announced. It's easy mm -hmm. to announce a program. Yeah. Yeah. It's, really, yeah. it's yeah. a lot harder to yeah. hit a target. Yeah. Yes, it yeah. is. And no once much. they figured that out, they dropped deliverology like a hot Yeah, potato. we haven't heard a lot about it yeah. lately. There's not a lot of deliverology going on. I uh, can't add anything to that. <laughs> um, this implies a pretty substantial long-term commitment from both of you. I don't know how long the long-term is. A year indefinite? Uh, well, we, we agreed to go another year. Yeah. And we're looking at m mapping these metrics uh, out to 2030. Yeah. I'm not suggesting Lisa and I will stay around that long. Uh, maybe we will, maybe we won't. Uh, but uh, we will be mapping these till 2030 and on an annual basis starting next year. Yeah. And we'll see where we are. Okay. And um, hopefully we will have 
uh, a robust, competitive um, economy focused on innovation, clean tech, Yep. Uh, the tech sector more generally, using all the creative capacities of all Canadians who are able to work okay. and want to work. Because this is talking about prosperity, because it's to some extent uh, uh, driven by uh, the efforts of the Business Council of Canada, which is the, the um, CEOs of largest corporations, mm. uh, some people will sense a sort of an essentially nefarious business agenda to lower taxes and uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. and um, prune back what has been an ambitious uh, period for government. Uh, is that it? Are you, are you, are you uh, stalking horses for corporate Canada? Are we fronting for corporate Canada? Is yeah. that what you're asking, Paul? Did that come I up? Did taxes come up I, I think we're pretty, oh. we put that to bed this morning with Paul Romer's discussion, yeah. which terrified me, <laughs> made Anne really happy. But it was, you know, basically he said very clearly to the room, and there was a lot of nodding heads in the room, that um, you know, when people come to you and say, if you just give us a tax cut, we're going to be more efficient, uh, what they're really saying is, give us a tax cut because we, we don't want to pay anymore. It's not as simple as that. Stuart Elgy mm -hmm. from yeah. Smart Prosperity said that tax mm -hmm. credits are what driving yeah. clean tech in the United States. Yeah. So that's how it came up. And then our comedian yeah. last night, Brittle Star, did a whole song about eating the rich. So that was a lot of fun yeah. as well, too. But to answer your question, no. I mean. Corporate Canada is as concerned as anybody is about making sure there's economic growth and prosperity. But as well, they understand, I think, because they're there, that this is about inclusion and getting it right this time. So it's not the top of the, it's not the top 1% getting all the benefit of the growth in GDP. And in fact, yesterday, if you, the subtext of the panel uh, with the president and CEO of Goodwill, yeah. uh, uh, community, uh, Foundations yeah. of Canada, Ray Williams from uh, the, the Black Opportunity uh, Fund, Opportunity Fund okay. in Toronto. He wasn't with us in person, but virtually. Yeah. And uh, the Aboriginal Alicia Finance. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you the subtext of they had wonderful examples of things that they were doing to ensure that uh, people from their communities were uh, included in economic opportunity, getting capital, whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the subtext was really private sector Canada is not doing enough that you're not doing your job you're not identifying and taking on board and training up reskilling whatever the case may be all these people who want to work and you're not doing it that was the subtext for me mm -hmm. in terms of that session and so this is not uh, 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 Lisa and me shilling, if you like, no. for big business in Canada. Uh, in fact, it's, it's a recognition of the fact that through partnership and collaboration, governments, big business, the nonprofit sector, uh, we all need to listen to each other, figure out where the gaps are, and start working to yeah. fill those gaps. And there are, only, there are certain things that only the private sector can do only the private sector because the government simply can't do it and one example is that was given by the president of Moderna today mm -hmm. he said governments tend to take a pot of money and try to spread it equally across the country based upon geography or whatever else in terms of ridings private sector doesn't do that they take bets and they make investments so you actually need to have private sector we need the Business Council of Canada involved in something like this uh but that there are, uh, as you've been saying, obligations in return. I mean, I actually, I, I, I moderated a panel on Canada's long-term prosperity in Banff last weekend, mm. and with very diverse perspectives, and almost the only thing they agreed on was that uh, for a society to thrive, you need all hands on deck. You need women, yes. you need previously yeah, uh, yes. marginalized communities, yeah. you need new yes. Canadians, yeah. you need, and you need uh, hiring officers who are not going to uh, pick and choose among those groups. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, Just on that point, sure. private sector generally, uh, I really think uh, HR, I, I've sat on a number of corporate boards. Um, you know, I hate to say this, but the VP HR sometimes doesn't get the same hearing as the chief financial officer at the board meeting. Actually, that HR vice president should be absolutely key to the future sustainability of any company in this country 
or the world as far as that goes, right? That person has got to identify the talent that the company or entity needs and make sure the skills that are needed are matched by the people and that you're keeping yeah. your people and you're creating the environment where they can be trained and trained up and, and keep up with the changes in um, uh, the, the innovative economy. So that HR unit in, in the private sector is so important and yet we, I think, sometimes don't quite value it the way we should. But in the time when all we're talking about is the great resignation, yeah. CEOs are laser focused on talent acquisition and retention and training. So they care yeah. about this as well. They're paying attention. We began this conversation, or, uh, or certainly about this um, uh, coalition, by saying you both were elected officials at a time when keeping a cap on public spending, um, uh, ensuring that each dollar was carefully spent was part of the deal. It was, it was something you couldn't avoid. Yeah. Um, when, when do you think that changed and, and, and why do you think it has changed as resoundingly? So for instance, let me make it clear, I'm not, I'm not secretly trying to get you to say mean stuff about <laughs> Justin Trudeau. Um, that's okay. Aaron O'Toole just, Aaron O'Toole just, <laughs> it better be because that's how I pay the rent these days. Um, uh, Aaron O'Toole just ran a campaign in which he promised to spend every dime as much as the Liberals over yeah, the next several yeah, years. Yeah. How did we get there? Lisa? How did we get there? Uh, well, I was part of that 2015 election yeah. where Tom Mulcair ran on reducing the deficit and getting back to balance, and Stephen Harper ran on the same thing, and Justin Trudeau ran on teeny tiny little deficit, $10 million, that's it, don't worry about it, it's going to be good. And it became bigger and bigger, and spending got more and more and more, and then COVID, mm -hmm. and everybody started spending and spending. I mean, we probably spent more in Canada than other countries did, if you measure it, you know, apples to apples. Um, and that being said, I'm, I'm heartened that I hear the Minister of Finance and the Deputy Prime Minister talking about the fact that, you know, it's time to, it's time to start thinking about where this ends. It's going to end at some point in time. Um, but when that happens, when it ends, they still got to think about economic prosperity and the taps are turned off. I think the role of government had started to change before 15. I mean, maybe not so much here, but if you looked across the world, people were starting to think that maybe we do need government for more things than we thought. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Trudeau, I think, rode that wave, mm -hmm. right? And um, then COVID comes along. They're an activist government to start with, right? Then COVID comes along, and all of a sudden, every Canadian realizes, oh my gosh, we can't do this by ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can't save our families and our businesses. I mean, business people who had never had a good thing to say about Justin Trudeau, thanking him, Doug Ford, <laughs> thanking him, because the government of Canada, working with other governments, right? That wasn't just the government of Canada, but my point is that people, I think, right now, but it happened before COVID, and I would say in and around the 15 period, uh, people started to take a look at their lives and their society and ask the question about the role of government and maybe it's not austerity, maybe it's not small government because we're missing things, there are gaps in our social safety net. That was driven home by COVID but I think people yeah. were starting it, to identify that already. What is the legitimate role of government and then that leads you to this whole new discussion around industrial policy mm -hmm. which was uh, you would never have heard Mr. Kretchen or Mr. Martin talk about industrial policy but now everybody in the free world is talking about industrial policy quite freely we're not maybe quite sure what the contours are and what it actually exactly means but it does mean a bigger role for government in shaping um, the economic future of each other's country, or each country. I'm going to answer with what I learned this week. Carol Mulkin said that if you think your wages haven't gone up and that your income has been depressed in the past number of years, you're probably right. So we did have wage stagnation. People aren't doing as well as they used to. They don't have as much money to spend. The government steps in and comes in with the Canada Child Care Benefit 
which really does increase people's spending ability, and that was borrowed money. So that's how you start with the spending. So to Anne's point, yes, government stepped in because wages flattened out, but people still needed to continue to live, and they sought um, revenue, and that's where the government stepped in. Good or bad, that's what happened. So let's sum up the work that is facing the cabinet, your uh, colleagues separated by a, a certain distance in time, but mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you were sitting at a cabinet table next week, um, you've got to begin to rein in what's nearly unprecedented peacetime spending. You've got to get serious about climate change and actually start hitting some of these targets. You've got to increase and expand opportunity to the sectors of the population that are not used yeah. to um, their fair share. Uh, it's starting to look like quite a tall order. I mean, does that, how does that compare to the tasks that face the cabinet that you, the cabinets that you sat in? Well, governing isn't easy, first of all. Uh, that's why it's not for the faint of heart. But, uh, I mean, we had the, we had the 08 recession and, and the Great Recession and managed as best we could through it. And you had, you had what you had in, in 93 to 97 to 98 when yeah. you started turning surpluses. But, I mean, it still has to get done. It doesn't matter how daunting it may be, just break it down and start working on things that are important. And on the climate file, I would just, one thing I took away was watch for unintended consequences. So it's not just simply putting it in place, it's making sure that when you put it in place, that you're aware of what else could happen and, and pivot and, and manage it. There's a lot to manage. This has to be a very focused, very competent cabinet in the next number of years. You know what focused us, other than the fact the IMF told us we were a third world nation and going to hit the debt wall, was in fact uh, the tool we used to start to work our way out of that hole was program review. And Chris Reagan from the Ecofiscal Commission, uh, universe, uh, McGill University, uh, has talked recently about the fact that he would like to see a new program review. Mm -hmm. Now that's not happening, right? That, uh, no one should leave this room with me suggesting this government is going to do a program review. At least one like uh, the one uh, Paul Martin uh, and David Dodge did uh, in that 95, uh, 96 period of time. But I. To Lisa's point, that program review was like about focus, right? And determining what your priorities are, what you need to do as the government of Canada, what can be done or should be done by other levels of government, mm -hmm. what should be done by the philanthropic sector, the private sector. And it was hard and everybody sacrificed, everybody did. But we were focused like a laser because we knew that nobody was going to buy our debt. Right? So we were focused like a laser. And I think this government, um, I'm, I'm not suggesting <laughs> that they're in the same situation we were, but they do need to focus and they need to figure out what, in my mind, the three or four big pieces that then empower the Canadian society to create that wealth, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we know what some of them are, $10 childcare. Right, big bet on clean tech and climate change. Big uh, bet, I think you'll see, and we, we heard about some of it over these past two days, uh, on skills, mm -hmm. talent. This government, I was chatting with someone uh, from the Department of Finance this week, and what he, one of the things he told me was, Anne, we want this, Canada, to be a place where people, our young people, our talent want to stay, but also the place talent from around the world wants to come, mm -hmm. right? So that's about that big talent issue that every CEO, yep. as Lisa said, in the country is worried about. So you can actually, I think, define the three or four big things I would like them to focus on, but really focus, yeah. right? And aren't they all reflected here? Yes, I'm, just <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sitting closer to that thing than you guys are, and it's just a thing of beauty. Uh, that, that it's round. Didn't you tell me the flowers? Uh, <laughs> uh, it doesn't have red on it, though. It's got no, blue. No, that's red. that's good. That's okay. I'm, you know, I I didn't push for red. No. Nope. <laughs> um, you talk about the importance of focus. Uh, I often find myself wondering, and this might even sound glib, 
is in focus just an awful lot harder for populations than it used to be in uh, uh, an era of perpetual cacophony. Social media, a million choices for where people can devote their attention. Is it not harder than it used to be simply to get noticed and to, and to push a set of ideas up the public agenda? I don't think so, and I think we have a great example of what happened during COVID. There is great focus, great cooperation. Everybody felt pain. Everybody felt pain in terms of how we were gonna deal with COVID and the response to COVID and, and eventually bringing on the vaccines and vaccinations and had lots of cacophony around it as and it still continues to this day. But the reality is we did come together focused and got the job done. You know, one of our speakers, Nobel laureate Paul Romer this morning, uh, one of the things he's most famous for is not the line he used this morning, and I'm not even sure he still believes it, but the line was, never let a good crisis go to waste, mm -hmm. right? And COVID was a crisis. And what you saw was collaboration mm -hmm. among all levels of government, the private sector, the philanthropic sector, uh, during the 08, 09 crisis, right. again, cooperation, yep. during our uh, challenges in the mid 90s, yep. uh, cooperation maybe a little more grudgingly from, but cooperation. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, all that to say that I'm, I'm not suggesting that we are at a crisis point in terms of the economy, but I think we need to focus because we could easily tip over mm -hmm. into something that looked like a crisis. If interest rates go up quickly, if inflation stays up, all of a sudden some of the bets that people have been making could uh, put us in a place that looks like a crisis if we're not yeah. in one. If you talk to a 25 to 35 year old, they'll tell you that there is a crisis because they can't afford a house. That's a crisis. Um, do you get the impression that, th there was a really interesting analysis the other day by uh, my friend Jen Gerson who has a newsletter called yeah, The Line, yeah, yeah. Uh, in which she said that Christopher Freeland's recent comments mm -hmm. lead her to suspect that the government is getting the message that uh, it's getting harder to buy debt. It's getting, uh, um, the recess might be over. Do you get the same impression that the government is beginning to think that it's in a different, it's entering a different period, a different phase? Or is that wishful thinking? Let's see what happens at the G20. You think the G G20 could be the venue for? Let's just see what the terminal, let's see what the talking points are coming out of the G20 and what they, what they may be hearing from other countries. I think that's always a good opportunity to get a, get a, a beat on what's happening around the world and compare Canada to what other countries are doing and determine are we ahead, are we behind, what's really going on. I am fairly cynical at my age about a lot of things. Um, although I am also a little Pollyanna-ish, I just wanna put that out there about uh, the world. Uh, I would say that probably the government is reading polls and those polls are telling them that the anxiety level around economic recovery and prosperity going forward and housing yeah. being an important part of it I think they're starting to see those polls reflecting that greater numbers more consistently especially as we come out of COVID and uh, any political party, any government worth its salt, is going to start to respond to that. Okay. Um, and just to kind of close the loop, are there, are there ministries in this government who you're going to be keeping a particular eye on uh, as we enter this period of, of different challenges? For the coalition? Yeah. Or just as experienced uh, observers of, uh, of uh, federal governments? I think it's... I think everybody's been talking about the right ones. For me, it's going to be natural resources, um, innovation, mm -hmm. I said, uh, finance. I think Francois-Philippe Champagne is going to be very important to any economic agenda this government puts forward. A, you know, a focused, uh, 
government taking some risks maybe government making some big bets and that's one of the things mm -hmm. that you've already referenced right from the president and CEO of Moderna mm -hmm. in this country we do it for the best of reasons we sprinkle money everywhere mm -hmm. right as he said in the biotech sector that's not good enough you yeah. need two or three big bets with big money from the government and then in partnership with the private sector right uh, where do those programs and that money lie with Francois Philippe Champagne, mm -hmm. right, in ISAP? Uh, obviously, the Minister of Finance can set the frame, and then on the climate change file, absolutely, you know, programs yeah. in NRCAN and uh, environment. But I think Francois Philippe has got many of the levers here that can drive economic growth. I should also mention Mary Ying, trade. Really? Right? Mm -hmm. We are an exporting nation. One third of our GDP comes from exports. We need to ramp that number up. Good point. We need to leverage the trade agreements we've signed. We make a big deal out of how many trade agreements we've signed, but we're not. And again, here's where the private sector needs to be a much more active partner. They have to step up and work with governments so that we're actually exporting what they're producing in mm -hmm. larger amounts and numbers around the world. And on right? the scorecard, you would find that measurement <laughs> on the current trade accounts. Yes. Where can I find, yes. where can I find the scorecard? And the scorecard. global ranking of financing for SMEs. See right there. Is awesome. this scorecard online somewhere? I'm going to leave it for you. <laughs> you can have it. It is. It's at CanadaCoalition.ca. Yeah. I had a hunch. Uh, <laughs> one thing I'm starting to remember from uh, almost two years ago is that when Trevor shows me the one minute sign, I have to start wrapping things up. So I'm going to thank Lisa Raitt and Anne McClellan for uh, sharing your wisdom and your experience and your, and, and your uh, perspectives on new challenges with us tonight. Uh, I want to thank uh, our uh, sponsors at the Canadian Bankers Association, our uh, media partners at CPAC, uh, and our hosts at the beautiful National Arts Centre for uh, getting the band back together and, uh, and uh, relearning with us how to do this. And I especially want to thank everyone here uh, in the Pacific Room and everyone watching at home for joining us in this conversation. I'm Paul Wells uh, for McLean's Magazine. Thanks and good night. <laughs>